Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is Northwest Brew Talk. Each and every week, we promote the Washington brewing industry by talking to those people involved and drinking Washington beer. With over 300 breweries, we try to highlight as many as possible every single episode. If you're new to the show, we suggest you check out our back catalog with some great interviews and tons of Washington beer. On today's show, episode 49, we have an interview with Brother Ass Brewing, our brew news, and other local music from Blackwater Prophet. If you have any comments or questions, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. If you like the show and want to support us, why not become a patron? With a donation, we offer everything from guest hosting the show to a copy of our upcoming book, Washington Beer. Head over to nwbrewtalk.podbean.com for more details. Now, to start the show, let's open our first beer. Okay, this is from Dirty Bucket Brewing. We believe this is called a Sassini IPA. Sassini, that we hope we are pronouncing right, is from Dirty Bucket. Dirty Bucket Brewing Company is located in Woodenville. They're open seven days a week and are kid and dog friendly. You can check out our interview with Steve on episode 13. That's a while ago. <laughs> Smells good. The Sassini IPA is a hop-forward aromatic IPA sure to please even the most finicky hop heads. With a balanced malt and northwest hop profile combined with a generous dry hopping of citra hops, Sassini will leave you gazing up at the stars wishing for more. Only a beer this good deserves to bear the name Sassini, a hop head in her own right. Sassini appreciated the fine characteristics brought on by citra hops. This beer is dedicated in her honor and to her memory. It's got 6.5% ABV, 72 IBUs, and an untapped rating of 3.69. All right. And uh, this is pretty good. And um, tonight uh, we talk about it sometimes, but tonight we actually had some wanes before we started the show here. It's uh, pretty dark, dark uh, golden copper color. And um, very, very talkative like our daughter. (laughs) And... um, Definitely, you could smell smell it right away. It's got a Definitely. very citrusy smell, citrusy yep. smell. <laughs> Definitely tastes those IBUs too. Yeah, it's but really it's very, good. it is very um, citrusy. Even the taste, yep. you know, it it is a little um, higher on the uh, on the IBUs, but uh, it's it's got a good flavor. Yeah, I like it. It's good. Yeah. All right, and that's our first. Beer, and now on to our brew news. Topping this week's news, Lowercase Brewing is celebrating their second anniversary this Saturday, January 16th. There are a limited number of tickets available. Check out our interview with Chris on episode 28. Strange Brewfest 12 will take place January 29th through the 30th in Port Townsend. This is a festival where many brewers let their hair down and create some interesting concoctions. There will be 35 breweries and over 70 different beers to sample. Tickets are $30 for both days, so book your room now so you can enjoy the fun. On Friday, January 29th, Foggy Noggin and Bothell will host a tasting of eight different English bitter, best bitter, special bitter, extra special bitters. This will be a special journey, learning about these styles and tasting the subtle differences these all have. Only 20 spots available, $25 per person, 21 and over. On Saturday, January 23rd, Elliott Bay Brewing in Seattle has their annual Ode to Darkness Imperial Stout Vertical Tasting event on the new back bar in Lake City. Okay, River City Brewing in Spokane had a great 2015, and they will be celebrating their third anniversary on Saturday, January 30th from 3 to 10 p.m. with some special beers, live music, and food from a couple of chefs, catering, and street cuisine truck. The event is all ages and will include 12 different beers on tap, including four 2014 vintages. The third annual Hop Mob Road Show will kick off at Brower's Cafe on Thursday, February 4th. The term Hop Mob refers to a robust collection of triple IPAs. These super hoppy beers typically weigh in at more than 10% ABV. The road show takes place over 10 days, and as of now, there are 35 participating breweries. For more info on the Hop Mob Robe Show, Robe, Robe, Road, Robe, Robe. <laughs> it's a road <laughs> show. 
go to their website, wahopmob.com. The Belgian Fest, sponsored by Washington Beer, is back on January 30th. The event will be held at Seattle Center Fisher Pavilion. There will be over 90 Belgian-style beers crafted by Washington breweries available. Featured beers include triples, doubles, saisons, wits, abbeys, and lambics. In keeping with this unique style, all of the beers are brewed with Belgian yeast. Tickets for 21 and over event are $35. The annual Pike Chaco Fest will be held on Sunday, January 31st from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. This adult-only event is romantic food and drink lovers delight, featuring over 65 of the area's premier breweries, wineries, distilleries, restaurants, cheesemakers, bakers, and chocolatiers will fill the Pike Brewing Company and entice you with delicious bites and tastes. Sample rare cask beers, many featuring chocolate, from the Puget Sound's top brewers. Best of all, Pike Chaco Fest benefits Puget Sound Keeper, who is protecting and preserving the waters of the Puget Sound. Brower's Cafe in Seattle will have its 14th annual Hard Liver Barley Wine Festival on Saturday, February 27th. This is a celebration of this amazing style of beer with over 50 barley wine, Old L's on draft starting at 11 a.m. There's usually a line for this much-anticipated event, so get there early. In a very interesting announcement just on Monday the 11th, a joint statement from Pabst and the Craft Brew Alliance was released. Pabst, the owner of Rainier Beer, which is currently produced in California, said that a new deal with Craft Brew Alliance, or CBA, would have them producing a new Rainier Pal Mountain Ale at the Woodenville facility. It will be the first time since 2003 that Rainier is produced in Washington. CBA used less than half of their 200,000 barrel capacity in 2015 at their Woodenville facility, so this new deal will help utilize that capacity. The deal doesn't end there, though, as Pabst has an option to purchase the Woodenville plant. Quote, being able to move volume out of Woodenville and into Portland, optimizing our footprint, is a huge benefit to CBA. Unquote, said CBA CEO Andy Thomas. That's right. As Rainier moves back to Washington, Red Hook, one of the original craft beers, may be leaving. And that's it for the Brew News this week. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you want to submit news to Northwest Brew Talk, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. Or if you've not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Podbean, or Stitcher. If you like us, a review or rating would be really appreciated. But most importantly, make sure you tell your friends about Northwest Brew Talk. Okay, so this is episode 49. Next week is episode number 50, and it also coincides with our one-year anniversary, which is very coincidental. woo uh, not like we didn't plan it that way, <laughs> but um, it's going to be a great episode. Um, we're not going to have one interview. What we're going to do is we're going to have clips from uh, um, almost every interview that we've done, a lot of the interviews over the year. We're also going to talk about um, uh, some of the events that we've done uh, over our first year and you know, just give a little recap of that along with our brew news. And uh, of course, we'll taste some special beers since it's our one year anniversary. So it uh, it should be a a a good show. Yep, going to be a fun time. And since, like I said, since there is a uh, new beer, you have to tune in. All right, now we're going to go to talk to Wally Wakeman from Brother Ass Brewing in Vancouver. We're talking with Wally Wakeman from Brother Ass Brewing in Vancouver. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderfully. Okay. Thank you for asking. Certainly. So, you have a um, relatively new brewery. So uh, what made you decide that you wanted to start a brewery? Well, it's uh, kind of a long story, but probably familiar with a lot. Uh, I'm an older guy, actually, uh, 58, and I've always wanted to have some sort of a, a pub, a bookstore, coffee shop, a brewery kind of deal going. And uh, Gosh, I think it probably started back in... Uh, 2004, uh, I made a list of what are those things that I am most passionate about, that where I feel most alive, and I realized that uh, a lot of those things were uh, around uh, beer and coffee and uh, building stuff, and uh, 
so that kind of became a dream that uh, stuck in the back of my head, and I just kept working on it. I worked in the uh, uh, insurance industry for about 32 years and just was always dreaming uh, in the background and making plans and things like that. Mm-hmm. And people would ask me, when am I going to do this brewery thing? And I was kind of like, well, probably when I don't have a job anymore. Mm-hmm. And as it out. My company wanted us to move to uh, Sacramento, and I have four kids. My wife and I have four kids here in the Vancouver area, and we didn't want to move away. So started thinking about, you know, what does Chapter 2 look like? And um, more and more that, uh, again, looked like self-employment. And then I thought, well, why can't I have a brewery at my house? And uh, discovered that there were, uh, you know, like Heathen Brewing, at, uh, fairly recent at the time, uh, and they were working out of their uh, uh, a building in, in his backyard, and then several other small breweries started in their home. And all of a sudden, you know, what was like seemed like a an impossible dream, I guess, became like, oh, this is this is actually a doable thing. Um, so we decided to to go for it. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, definitely breweries like uh, Foggy Noggin and Bothell. You know, running out of a small building plus their garages, actually, their like their little tap room. So it's mm-hmm. uh, it's not an uncommon thing. But uh, so you decide to uh, start this. Now you had been home brewing for a while. Yeah, uh, kind of goes back to that list of things that make me come alive. And on that list was beer and coffee and stuff. I thought, well, why don't I start learning more about the things that I really enjoy? So I started the home brewing then and. Uh, developing recipes and kind of like everybody else, uh, you know, uh, it was kind of funny. The first time I brewed, I was just a real nervous about cleanliness and everything. And I really just had this little extract kit. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that was the one and only time we did that. But my friend came over and he had brewed before and I was all nervous about it. He picked up a stick from the backyard and started stirring <laughs> it and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I, I was like, okay, I don't have to worry about this too much. It is going to boil, and and uh, then we moved from there to to uh, all grain and and developing recipes. And uh, a lot of the beers I do now are recipes that I developed as a home brewer. And um, yeah. So, what uh, what was the first craft beer that uh, that you really fell in love with? Oh gosh, so. Uh, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm an old guy, and back in the day, it was a big deal to get the uh, Coors in Ohio. Oh, <laughs> that yeah. was the craft beer, but it was different, you know, than mm-hmm. the standard stuff that you could get. And uh, But then we moved to Portland in 87, so just the uh, Portland Brewing Company and, and their uh, their ales, and uh, probably started Hefeweizen, and then ales, and then on to IPAs, and uh, just trying a variety of different beers, but probably the probably the uh, Portland Ale. Okay. All right. So when uh, when you started brewing for yourself, um, when you were doing your home brew, what uh, what kind of beers were you brewing then? Um, probably like a lot of home brewers, I would try different beers that I liked, and then kind of look for how can you you know, match that and look at a lot of different clone recipes and say, you know, what's similar and different and what would I want to do differently with it? And um, so I started, you know, uh, my wife like uh, Ruby. So I started with like a, a blueberry ale. Uh, uh, that uh, now is very different. Uh, we have a farmhouse ale and I had blueberries to it, but it's a very different beer than I did uh, back then. Uh I probably was in an IPA rut for a long time. Oh, sure. Uh, I like IPAs, so I tried, you know, lots of different varieties of, of uh, IPAs. Um, yeah, that's uh, that, it, that's pretty common around here. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Brewers Association, you know, new statistics just came out, and IPA is still the biggest category in the country. So it's not even just locally, but... Uh, it is just by far the biggest selling category. Yeah, it's catching up everywhere else, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I mean, so you tried different, tried brewing different things. Like you said, you got 
brewed probably quite a bit of different IPAs. What, what did you do different when you were brewing them? Did you try different different hops and and different variations to get different flavors? Uh, yeah, kind of. You know what's available. So uh, uh, I came up with a recipe. For example, it was mostly Simcoe, and then uh, couldn't get Simcoe one year, so tried it with Citra. Uh, so just variations on a theme. Uh, to see kind of what you like, and um, so not a whole lot of yeah you know, magic or science to it. I think it's a, I'm I'm real big on uh, experimenting and trying new new things. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, I say that, but maybe not as much. I'm also kind of trying to hone in on my particular beers now to get them where I want them. Right. Uh, but you know, we'll go from five and ten gallons to 90 gallons uh, still in the major everything goes according to you know, how you want it to end, end up with the end result right so <coughs> excuse me so do you um, do you try and source uh, source your uh, ingredients locally I know you said like blueberries yeah um, well you know, in Vancouver, you know, we've got the Country Malt Group and uh, Brewcraft and Brewer Supply Group for a lot of the stuff, so it's easy for me to uh, jump in the van and go pick up the, the grains and hops and stuff that I need. Uh, I've had a lot of, uh, some of my hops actually have come from uh, excess from uh, Heathen Brewing or Lewitt Brewing. Oh, nice. I've picked up some hops from them. Uh, they've been, you know, real, real helpful. Uh, yeah, like I said, I didn't think I could get Simcoe very easily uh, because, uh, you know, not a contract brewer and all that, and he even had a, a lot of them, so I, I got to pick up a lot of Simcoe, which I really love. Um, for my blueberry ale, uh, I don't use any extracts or anything. I put two to three pounds of blueberries uh, aged on my farmhouse ale, and my blueberries come from uh, Blue Ridge Farm up in Woodland. A good friend of mine actually... When we're done brewing, his he comes and picks up the grain, and his horses get the grains, and I get blueberries from him, and a lot nice. of a lot of helpful. Uh, he's helped me with a lot of things. Uh, there's a coffee uh, roaster in Vancouver, a new coffee roaster, uh, Rep Relevant Coffee, and uh, Mitch Montgomery and, and his partner Brigida. Uh, actually, when we're done, uh, Mitch will probably be around today to. Uh, pick up a container for some cold brewed coffee for our uh, chocolate coffee style. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I try to try to keep things as local as possible. Right. So what kind, uh, it sounds like you brew a, a pretty wide variety of beers. Do you try to brew things that, uh, that you like, or do you think that your customers would like? Yeah, both of the above. Uh, starting with beers that, that we like, uh, my my second son Josh brews with me uh, when I when I do just I don't uh, so he comes and we talk about what do we want to do next and stuff so certainly we want the community to like what we like and we're always open to feedback and and uh, growing and, and changing but it it starts with what do we really enjoy mm-hmm. um, we have seven taps at the at the brewery my my tasting room is my driveway and and people coming into the to the garage brewery nice uh, but i do have seven beers on tap and i'm available thursday nights uh since i'm kind of doing it by myself for uh tasting and growler fills and and things like that and so we do try to keep a variety uh i have a typically have a farmhouse ale and it's a what i like to think is a approachable and uh, kind of moderate and versatile. So I uh, serve the farmhouse ale by itself, but I also like to age it on blueberries. I, I like to age it on roasted chilies. Uh, I like, I'm going to try it on coffee. And what's fun is it goes in you know three and four different directions. Right. Um, and have had a lot of good feedback on it. Uh, we have a uh, chocolate coffee stout, uh, with lots of uh, molasses and brown sugar and, like I say, about uh, four gallons of cold brewed coffee and 
uh, it's it's kind of a fun uh, flavor dance. Uh, we do a, a black IPA. We call it Black Knight CDA. Um, lots of different uh, malts and uh, like you know you're gonna have different tasting notes at different times. You get a little chocolate here. And, uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, then we have a pale ale and a uh, and an IPA. Um, kind of intrigued. Uh, I think of like a uh, little something, something, or a little something extra, a little something wild. And I, I kind of like the idea of kind of having similar flavor profiles, but different uh, outcomes as far as you know the the ABV or uh, you know how how bitter it is or uh, things like that. So my pale ale and my IPAs are very similar flavor profiles, but one is uh, the pale ale is a lower uh, ABV. It's kind of a fence sitter between a between an IPA and a pale ale. Okay. Okay, interesting. So, Vancouver is uh, is where you're located, and Vancouver seems to be a um, a little growing hotspot there for breweries. The uh, past year, quite a few have uh, started to pop up, and you know, do you see it as a as you know a growing destination for you know beer tourists? Yeah, you, you know, I, I hope so. Um, we've been here, you know, close to twenty years, and. Uh, it has been fun to watch kind of Vancouver come into its own uh, over those years. You know, I think it uh, forever is kind of a little bedroom community of Portland. Uh, but I think uh, more and more uh, uh, we're our own space and uh, have our own feel. And and uh, I'm really uh, kind of pleased and proud of the Vancouver uh, breweries uh, as, a, as a community. And again, uh, I think increasingly as a destination uh, for people to to visit so you have you have a three barrel system right yep pretty pretty small compared to most right yeah but that's what a lot of guys start out with but uh, um, do you see this uh, you, you know you're looking down the road is is it growing you know a uh, year past uh, a year out of um, starting is it growing to the point where you anticipated um, you know, I, I didn't really know exactly what to anticipate, just to be honest. Uh, a lot of people have very detailed business plans, uh, and they're also kind of uh, uh, betting, their, betting the farm on the future, if right. you will. And, and my business plan is very simple. It's to uh, try to stay out of debt and grow reasonably. And so, you know, right off the bat, um, when, I, when I retired, I had a... a severance package and a, and a small pension and the pension pays most of the bills and the severance package, you know, I got to buy most of the, uh, most of the equipment. So All right. uh, I want to uh, make haste slowly, if you will, but I don't want to over promise and under deliver. I really want to uh, make good beers consistently that, that I and the uh, community enjoy and then try to grow from there. And uh, I'm, I'm, pleased that, uh, you know, there's probably uh, 20 plus, uh, uh, I wouldn't say accounts, but places that I've sold to uh, with lots of repeat business. I do my own uh, distribution and um, that's been kind of fun. uh, That's good. So uh, you're going to grow slowly there and um, you're doing a little distribution. So Looks like uh, you are on, uh, you know, on the uh, slow and steady path, which is uh, um, never a bad thing because, like you said, some some people go in, you know, with uh, two million dollars in debt and they have to pay that back somehow, you know, with these giant breweries and tap rooms and everything. So it's definitely not a a, a bad way to start. Yeah, and I, I think um, you know, with the with the three barrel system, even though it is uh, small. Um, by adding, you know, a few, uh, a few more bright tanks and, and more fermenters. And I, I think that could support a small, uh, brew pub, um, in, in the future, potentially again. So 
talking to Tyler Brown at, at Marley Browns, it was real fun to see, you know, his smaller system that, uh, similar in size and, uh, and doing what you love and trying to make, make good beer and, and hope that people, uh, also enjoy it. Yeah. And, and, you know, unless, unless you're in this for the money, that really is the goal, isn't it? To make beer that, that people enjoy. Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of people that are in it for the money, and uh, some of them will will see those larger returns, and and uh, I think many won't. So um, I'm a I'm more of a, a low risk kind of kind of guy, but also a, you're, uh, you're an insurance guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my son, my oldest son, teases me about that. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I think there's yeah. Well, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, Wally. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Appreciate uh, hearing a little bit about your brewery, and uh, you know, good luck. Thanks very much, Mike. Have a great day. Thanks you too. All right. Thanks to Wally from Brother Ass Brewing for joining us today. We'll be right back after a local music break from Blackwater Prophet. <laughs>
That was Yellow Trees from Blackwater Prophet. You can check them out at blackwaterprophetsbocan.bandcamp.com. If you want to have your music played on Northwest Brew Talk, contact us today. And now, let's try another beer. All right, this time we have Pal Al from Burdick Brewing. Burdick Brewing is open seven days a week and located in Seattle. All right. The Burdick Pale Ale was made to simply pair well with burgers and pizza. Those are sweet foods. This beer is dry with an emphasis on hops rather than malt. It's got a 4.6% ABV and 25 IBUs and an untapped rating of 3.66. All right, this one is more of a golden color. Oh, yeah. Uh, big head on it. Uh, big white head on it. And it is, um, wow, very malty. Very malty flavor. And it has a um, definitely a, a different uh, flavor than our uh, IPA that we tried. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it. Uh, I know it says that it's uh, has an emphasis on the hops as opposed to the malt. Exactly, but it definitely tastes malt. And uh, looking at the bottle here, they've got uh, three or two row Crystal Sixty and Munich malt. So they've got three malts in here, obviously. So they're trying to. Uh, to give you a good balanced flavor, which is what they've done. I think a nice burger would taste real good with that. <laughs> yes, because it's very mild. It doesn't have that that uh, high IBU. Yeah. You know, a lot of citrusy stuff from um, like an IPA. So yeah, this is this has got a good flavor. It would be good with a burger or pizza or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. But um, yeah, that was good. I want you to give me fresh beer. You serious? This week's fresh no! beer is from Ghost Fish Brewing. They announced the release of their fifth packaged beer, Peak Buster Double IPA. This bold beer will be available in 22 ounce glass bottles year round at the Ghost Fish Brewing Tap Room and numerous retail locations within their distribution area. Peak Buster Double IPA is 100% gluten free, brewed with malted Milton and buckwheat, and hopped with Eureka, Centennial, and Summit hops. Eureka! These hops create a powerful aroma of tropical fruits, mango, passion fruit, lychee, citrus, and pine. Beak Peak Buster Double IPA comes in at 9.4% ABV and 120 IBUs. That sounds over the top. (laughs) This beer is deceptively drinkable despite its high ABV and high IBUs balanced, but with a hint of warmth on the finish. We're definitely going to have to look for that because it... It sounds deceptive. <laughs> yes, it does, and it's, it's intriguing. You, you know, you want to try it now just to see how deceptive it really is. And uh, since it's goat's fish, it's free, so that'll be interesting. All right, and that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. This show is produced and edited by me with engineering help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or on Twitter at nwbrewtalk. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hopping, my friends.